Welcome to Inspirational Journeys with Straight Talk with Nolan. I have a journey, you have a journey, but how many of us share our journeys to inspire others? Our journeys are authentic and they are real, and I'm sure every single one of you will resonate with it. So today I am humbled and honored to speak to Tavania Modley. I've been following her for a while and really felt that we needed to hear more about her story so that we can help share her amazing journey. So you must be wondering if you've seen her story already or heard it, amazing journey. Yes, I call it an amazing journey. And the reason being is if we look at what she's been through, all the obstacles she's gone through, and we always see it as obstacles, we're never gonna move forward in life. And I'm sure she will testify to that as well. So we have to learn from everything that we've gone through and move forward with our lives stronger than ever. So I call it the painful moments. And I heard this from Michael Beckwood, who is one of my coaches as well. And he says, we grow through pain. And that's so true as well. There's only one way. The other way you can grow through is through insight as well. But of course, in life, it's never a straight line. There's always going to be ups and downs as well. So Tavania, welcome to our show. It's so good to have you here today. I think just to start with, uh, to set the ball rolling, tell us a little about where you are from, what do you do, and maybe just touch a little on your activist work as well, because I love what I'm seeing. Uh, I loved watching your your video early on as well. And I'm really inspired by your journey. I really am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, It's really a pleasure to be having these conversations. I think the work that you do is incredible, giving this kind of platform Um, is a testament to, I think, the tenacity of the human spirit. Um, And that's a message that I drive. So I am a brown girl from Peter Maritzburg, and I'm very proud to say that because I think that coming from a small town, um, there's, you know, almost a ceiling in which we um, consider life to be. Um, And I never saw a girl like me um, that I could emulate growing up. And so my decision a few years ago was to actually become that woman for many different uh, brown girls that um, you know feel as if they don't fit the mold. That was effectively me. And um, I'm now in Johannesburg. I've been in Johannesburg for about 14 years. Um, it feels like home to me. And uh, the work that I've been doing has been in the last seven years. Um, you would know from my story that I had a failed suicide attempt seven years ago. And that was the catalyst for real change in my life. It uh, actually propelled me to start asking the really hard questions um, and also to push me toward my purpose. Um, You spoke about Michael Beckwood and I'm actually a huge fan of his. And he talks about um, pain pushing you, but your vision pulling you. And that was something that was really profound for me because I always had a dream for many years to aspire to be more than what I thought I was. And that vision and the dream was something that, you know, was almost like a whisper that I had grown up with um, until it became a roar. And the roar was literally the wake up call of that failed suicide attempt. Um, You would also know that I've had the experience of rape and um, intimate partner violence. And so I decided that The reason that I survived um, was to be able to not just start the conversations that matter, but that truth was a bridge that led one to the other. And I think that we're also desperate for it. We're desperate for truth in its substantive form. And my story was exactly that. It was an invitation for other people to examine their truth before it actually results in something quite catastrophic like a failed suicide attempt. So my days are now spent actively having those very hard conversations, doing some consulting work and uh, creating advocacy for GBV and mental health. Well, thank you. So two things that we have in common. So I'm also from PMB, uh, namely so small world. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah. So we'll we'll definitely catch up on that. And the other part uh, that I want to get directly into is your suicide, right? So I can resonate with that. Uh, in 1989, when I failed my metric, I almost took my life as well. But uh, God was on my side. And maybe at then I realized that I had a bigger purpose and I got saved. So I want to know a bit more about your, your suicide because it's so real. And the fact that in today's world, the generation that we have today, 
look, let's be honest, right? Suicide is the easy way out for many people. So yeah. tell us a little about suicide and how we, how we can help other people not to think, or when they think about suicide, how, what can they think differently about it? I actually don't think it's an easy way out. I actually think from my own personal experience, and maybe this is something you'll attest to as well, the pain is so enormous that all you want to do is escape it. And it's not the easiest thing to want to escape it. Um, it is literally what is available. So for me, I thought life was done with me. I was done with life. Um, I had had a succession of very serious life events that led to um, you know, the depression being compounded, uh, which finally led to the failed suicide attempt. So it wasn't just one thing. It was 20 years of um, a, you know, being depressed and not having the exact terminology for it. Um, there's also a lot of stigma attached to, to uh, depression and suicide. And I think that, you know, if we have to destigmatize and start embracing those conversations and, and really looking at mental illness differently um, and depression dif differently, we'd be able to save a lot more lives. For me, I was, um, I was a single mom with two kids at the stage, and that didn't even deter me from um, wanting to end my life. I actually felt that my children would uh, not benefit from me being around. Um, I felt like I was a failure in every sense of the word. I had lost everything at that stage financially. Um, I was out of my second marriage and I went straight head on into another relationship after that marriage. Um, and the person ended up cheating with my then best friend of 13 years. So that for me was the catalyst for the suicide ideation. And it was something that I had planned meticulously for, I think, probably a month and a half. So I had written letters to my children and the idea was to um, drive off a notorious bridge in Santon um, where people literally die um, from that bridge. And it was going to look like an accident basically. And I got out into the night um, on the 3rd of June, 2014. And I was driving like a maniac. But what you described as God, um, for me was divine providence. Um, I don't remember how I got to uh, the, my front door, but it was almost like I had blacked out and my car was lifted off of the road and placed in front of my garage. Even to this day, seven years later, I have literally no idea how that happened. I cannot recall anything from, I know how I was driving um, out into the night. I remember cars hooting all around me and I remember like literally I was doing like over 200 at one stage. Um, and the journey from, I was working in central Santon to home was probably like 30 minutes. Um, and it was probably, it was late at night. Uh, I can't remember much of the details, but it, I know that it was late. I worked uh, till about nine. I was a client services team leader at that stage uh, at a law firm. So I uh, used to finish work quite late. So that was the plan. And, you know, for me, that was literally um, providence that allowed me to actually, uh, you know, I don't know what uh, happened basically to get me back in front of my, my garage. But when I got home, I was still, I mean, nothing changed. I didn't feel as if I had survived anything. Um, for me, I still wanted to, to die. That was my you know, pervasive thought. Um, and then when I got to work the next day, I planned to have it done the very next day. And my manager at the time, uh, gave me the greatest gift that I think another human could give someone. And she literally cornered me. And she said to me that, I know that something is up with you. I don't know what it is, uh, but you're going to get help. And if you don't get help, then you're fired, basically, because I know that something's up with you. And so I, being me, um, you know, just gave her all of the expletives that uh, people know me for. I, I literally told her to F off and mind her own business. And she was relentless. 
So on that very day, the way serendipity works, I was actually instructed to have a conversation with a man that has a um, also a coaching business, but he does a form of uh, personal development in the form of a, of a workshop um, with its foundation on, in ontology, which is the study of the way of being. I had a conversation with this man and all he said to me was, give him three days. If the three days doesn't work, I can do whatever I want to do. Because she obviously would have said to him that she knows that I am suicidal or she knows that something's up. Because the way that I had been speaking is you know, basically saying my goodbyes. Um, that was, I think, a Wednesday or a Thursday. I was able to get onto that workshop on the Friday. And this is how the miracle of you know, serendipity works. Um, that workshop, three days later, saved my entire life. I am literally alive because of those two humans and the bunch of humans that were there holding space for me. And on the Monday, I emerged as somebody completely different. And I became this version of the woman that you know now. And all it took was three days of an absolute miracle. Um, I got to work the Monday and I resigned immediately. And my idea was to pursue my dream of writing. And um, the rest is history. I'm alive now because of that. Wow. Well, I'm glad that your co-worker stepped in when she did as well, right? Because uh, it's always the universe that's guiding people into our lives and not for no reason. And, and we can be the most stubbornest of people as well. And people just yeah. have our best interest at heart as well. So I'm glad that you survived. I'm glad that you're here to you. share your story with the world. Uh, yeah. That's, that's quite important. And this happened in 2014, you said, right? Yeah. So that's not really long, uh, long ago anyway. What would you, if you go back seven years now and you think about yourself in the situation, what would you be telling yourself? Let's just say it, it is at night that you're driving. What would you tell yourself? I can actually still connect with that version of women that I was back then. And the one thing that I think I would have said is you are enough because that sentence was so extremely loaded because the narrative for my entire life was that I was not good enough. That was the driving force that led me to make all of the decisions that I made. Um, and if you've got a spiritual foundation, you'll understand how um, the universe works, that if you have a fundamental belief, the universe is going to reinforce that message. So every experience that I had was one that affirmed that I'm not good enough. Every relationship that I had entered affirmed I'm not good enough because that was my fundamental belief all my life. And I think the one message I would have gone and, you know, instilled or enforced is, um, you know, you are enough. And I think that was the message that I had gotten from my tribe, as I call them now, um, over that three day period with that workshop, because what they basically did was gave me permission to be who I truly am and not the version that the world taught me I had to be. So I was given permission to be different, to be a nonconformist, to be a rebel, um, to be a writer, to be an author, to dream. And it was something that, um, you know, we have a prescribed way, especially in the Indian culture, you have to, you are raised with a certain belief that you have to be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, accountant, whatever. You have to get married, have children, you stay, in that marriage, you don't air your dirty linen, you know, you know, all of those uh, Indianisms. And I just could never, I could never conform to that. And I think the greatest gift that they had given me was the permission for me to be myself. Um, I'm also very realistic about the fact that sometimes people are not ready to hear a message. So even if I had gone back and said, you know, enveloped myself with love seven years ago, it may not have landed because I was in so much of pain. Um, what released me was being able to express the truth of that pain. Yeah. And I think that was, that was a very powerful thing. So powerful message for even the audience and our listeners out there. I am enough, right? So believe it or not, uh, just by, so I, I've done this a few times. I've taken lipstick and I wrote it on my mirror, I am enough. And I've actually taken out photos and I keep it like in my laptop as well. You know how powerful it is when you start loving yourself and when you realize that you are the best you for you as well. So it's quite important that people self-love in this day and age, 
is not something that we should be ignoring. We should be really learning how to love ourselves. Work where, where Tabania comes from. I come from the same culture as well. Uh, it's a lot of conditioned mindsets. Go to school, get a good education, go to university, get married, have children, nice job, end of school. That's it, life. Why? Because we taught to live our parents' goals and not our goals. I mean, this mm-hmm. all of us so many years. Uh, I, I know you would have come across this, Tabania, very uh, a while ago when you realized you need to start following your purpose and not what your mm-hmm. parents aspired you to be. And when mm-hmm. you did that, your life changed, and it changed so That's much. Yeah. Like, especially to the youngsters that are listening as well. Uh, yes, suicide is not a it's not an easy thing. But what what I would also suggest is when you do have the thought, take the second to pause and breathe. I know uh, it's very difficult to do it, but speak to someone, even if it's for mm-hmm. five minutes. Just speak to someone for five minutes and watch because the person that's doing the work is not really that person. All they're doing is in that five minute conversation, they're triggering something into your mind, into your subconscious mind, that's allowing you to kind of, I don't wanna say wake up call, but allowing you to realize, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this now. Maybe I should be thinking about it uh, as well. So my, my situation hasn't been as bad as yours. You tried the second yeah. time, it was the one, the first time and that was, and I was, I was more embarrassed about society, what my neighbors mm-hmm. were and how embarrassed mm-hmm. were. And I'm sure you felt mm-hmm. as well, right? Yeah, because I mean, I was I was uh, raped when I was 18 and I fell pregnant and I had to have an abortion and I kept that secret for 15 years or however many years it was. And then soon after I was uh, married at the age of 19 and then I fell pregnant immediately with my daughter and then three months later I was out of that marriage. So the shame was just compounded. There were like a million reasons to be ashamed. Uh, I dropped out of university. I didn't complete my degree. And I, uh, you know, got into an entry level job as a receptionist, answering a phone for like 800 rand a month. So I felt, you know, this absolute sense of hopelessness. Um, and that, you know, reinforced that message of I am not good enough, I am not good enough. And I just felt like no matter what I did, I would always be seen as a failure. And then when I got married for the second time and I made the tough decision to exit that second marriage, the shame was just on a completely different level. I mean, the judgment from even people in my own family, truth be told, was exceptionally hard. Um, It was exceptionally hard to continue to listen to my own internal voice when I've got the whisperings of everyone around me that is telling me, you are making a mistake, you, you, know, you are embarrassing the family or whatever the narrative was at that stage, I can't remember. Um, so the thing that I say to people now, because I have had the privilege, and I call it a privilege, of having people entrust me with their truth, and it's been really hard truths. Um, and I have spoken a lot of people out of suicide. And I think the one thing that differentiates me is the fact that I come from a space of empathy where there's absolutely no judgment. Um, I think the one thing is that people need to hold space for other people. And if you know the meaning of love, you need to be able to love unconditionally because I think the mentality is depression, especially is something that you can just change at the flip of a switch. And it just, it never works like that. Um, And if you look at people that have got uh, alcohol addictions or drug addictions, for me, that is a symptom of a a cause. But we look at trying to triage the symptom and deal with the symptom and label the person instead of looking at the cause. And the cause is very often repressed trauma or somebody that is negating their truth. So the question that I ask people immediately is, you know, what is your truth? What is it that people are not hearing you say? Or what is it that you're afraid to say? Or who are you afraid to be? And then all of that comes out. And I think that is what we need to start giving people permission um, for right now is the ability to own and speak and live their truth without fear. To be themselves, right? To be yeah, themselves. absolutely. And like yeah, absolutely. Absolutely conditionally as well. Don't be, don't be afraid of who you are. You know, a, a lot of the times when I, when I speak to people as well, like yourself, I, I keep telling people, be your authentic self. Don't try and be somebody you're not. It doesn't work. Yeah. You, you're unique for a reason. 
So, so yeah. just, you know, carry on being yourself. So, but that's, that's also very hard. Um, you know, I have to say it's incredibly difficult and I get the same message, especially again, I'm going to go back to, to the Indian community. I've had a lot of young people in their very early 20s at the prime of their life, at the beginning of their life, say to me that they can't be who they are because they're going to be um, ostracized, they're going to be written off by their parents, they're going to be um, you know, breaking their parents' hearts. And I think that as parents, I'm a mother, and I think that people, parents especially, need to be holding a mirror to themselves and asking themselves the hard questions. And I think people are just terrified of doing that. People of my generation and people that are older, um, anyone who, who's a parent needs to be able to hold a mirror and actually understand that your child is a separate person, a separate soul, and you don't get to live vicariously through them. And they are not here to fulfill all of your unfulfilled yearnings. Um, it just, you know, you need to actually understand that they're completely separate and that your love is not conditional upon you know, whether they fit a mold or not. You have to love them exactly as they are. And, you know, a lot of the time, I also hear people say to me, young people say to me that, um, you know, the parents are worried about what the family will say or how, you know, people would be received. I've got a lot of kids that come to me, um, you know, say, saying that they, they're actually gay, but they can't express their truth. They can't live their truth and they would sooner kill themselves. So my question is always, do you want to bury your child? Is that what you'd like? Would you like to bury your child or would you actually want to then accept your, your kid for who they are? And I think that is a really difficult conversation to have. No, that's so true. And uh, you, you know what parents as well, if you look at the generations we, we all have come from as well, it's been like this for, it's not only what uh, just normal day routine, it's also about religion as well. This becomes yeah. so conditioned into you that you just want that's to do it. But yeah. with, with parents that are listening out there as well, parents need to stop this immediately. I've, I've heard a, a lot of stories recently where kids went to university and when you asked them what they're studying for, no, I'm doing this, I'm going to become a doctor. Are you happy? Yeah. I'm doing it to yeah. satisfy my parents, which is utter bull. Yeah. So parents, parents don't catch a wake up. I mean, the yeah. only way they're going to catch a wake up is by relating to their child and not relating to their parents, what their yeah. parents want to them. So they need to change their mindset at some point and start focusing on the well-being of their child and not yeah. the well-being of that certificate or whatever they want attached to the name because of status. I yeah. mean, not, not, in, not in today's world. So good job on, on, on schooling your kids the, the way that yeah. you believe works for them or should work for every single young child out there as well. They're going through a lot. This generation, yeah. they have the potential they need the guidance and they need the guidance from people that have lived the journeys, not just from somebody who's going to say, okay, you need to do A, B, and C. It doesn't work like that anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as you say, the, the I had to do the work on myself first. Yeah. I had to heal all of those broken parts of myself first. I had to get real with myself. I had to, you know, have a real hard look about what I was indoctrinated with. And I had to break down all of that. It was literally a process of unbecoming, unbecoming everything the world told me I had to be and find out exactly who I am. And what that's done is that that has inadvertently given my children permission to be who they truly are. Because I am now at a space where I'm at peace. I'm happy. I'm living my dream. I don't, you know, and I say this with much respect, I really do not give a shit about what people say about me. I live my life authentically. Um, you know, I get a lot of flack on social media for a lot of things all the time because I'm so vocal. But at the same time, it has empowered my children to step up and, you know, really own who they are. And my daughter is 20 years old. My son is 11. So they're completely different children and I meet them where they are. So my girl is like a firecracker. She's feisty. She's, you know, a straight A student and she's a go-getter. My son is very chilled, very laid back, very, very sensitive. He is the most, sens uh, most sensitive boy. And I don't, you know, teach him to be different. I don't teach him um, or either of them to conform to um, ideals of masculinity and femininity. But these were the things that I had to learn. It was the stuff that I had to unlearn and unbecome about what it means to be a woman in this world. 
And in that way, I can now become a better parent. So we have an obligation as parents to do the work internally, to heal all of that stuff, and also to live our best lives so that we can give our children a template for what that looks like. Because children don't learn what we say and what we teach them. They learn what they see, okay. right? They, they live. Yeah. So, you know, that for me is, is a massively important thing. No, that's powerful. And parents need to be able to be wanting to change as well. Because parents need yeah. to get this notion out of their, their minds and their heads that they are always right. And I am the elder. Yeah. It's all about you. Respect. Yes, respect is, is there. But respect works both ways. It's not, yeah. one, it's not a one-way streak as well. So I get the same. Whenever I step out of line as well, my daughter and my son are very quick to put me back on track. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, sometimes you just go up there. So yeah. I, I know you've been a victim of gender-based violence as well, right? Uh, yeah. so, so what I'm keen to understand is, and I like this about you, uh, I must tell you this. Although you've been a victim of GBV, you're still focusing on men's health, men's mental yes. health. Right? Yeah. I like this because... A lot of people think that uh, men, well, not only men, mental health is not important. But you look around today, everything is about mental health. Everybody is not in the, in the, in the right state of mind, the right space of mind. What made you yeah. change? What made you realize that, okay, we need to also fix men? Let's call it that way. Fix men's mental health. So I have spent the last seven years exhaustively working on myself. So in my learning and, and from my own desire to heal, and also this journey with forgiveness was a huge thing because I felt very much like a victim. And I don't really like to call myself a victim anymore. Um, I feel like I've transcended that. I, I say now that I've had the experience of it because I don't like to connect with that energy of being a victim. I feel like I've taken ownership of my life story. But in this quest to forgive, which was an extremely hard thing, I think, you know, forgiveness was the one barrier to me being able to actually um, heal. And it was an all encompassing forgiveness, not just, you know, the perpetrators, it was forgiving myself for decisions that I made. And I think that was the hardest thing is to be, being able to forgive myself. So in this journey of learning about mental health, I realized that there is a direct correlation between mental health and gender-based violence. Because what happens as a society, again, is that we are so big on retribution, right? We want to punish. I mean, vigilantes are all over. When, uh, you know, when I speak to people around me, friends, family even, um, that hear about a woman being beaten, immediately the men say, well, he deserves a hiding. I don't believe in retribution. I believe in restitution because I think that if you want to affect real change in this world, it is not about putting in more uh, violent tactics. Violence in and of itself is not a deterrent for violence. If you want to go and castrate somebody or bring in the death penalty, that's not going to stop people. It's going to put more violent energy out into the world. So for me, and I think the foundation again comes from my spirituality, is the fact that I do believe that people are inherently good. And what happens is that men have also been, um, you know, uh, what is the word? They have been um, unfairly affected by patriarchy. And that is a hugely contentious issue, but it is something that is absolutely true if we have to dig deep and examine it. Because as much as patriarchy didn't um, work for women, it also didn't work for men. Because men had this model that they had to um, be raised with, you know, and that meant that vulnerability was seen as a weakness. So the only way a man could express any kind of emotion was anger. And anger for me is nothing more than suppressed sorrow. So if you have to look at it, and if you have to dig deep into the mindset of a perpetrator of violence, there is a lot of unhealed pathology. There is a lot of repressed trauma. And if we have to start giving our men more permission to be vulnerable, to be able to have those difficult conversations, if men give other men permission to be vulnerable, believe me, we would make strides, real strides into eradicating this pandemic um, because GBV is a pandemic in and of itself. So 
it was through that all of that understanding that you know we are fixated with looking at the symptoms of bad behavior but we actually need to be looking at the cause the cause is mental health no absolutely and you know a lot of the times we don't go uh, we don't dig a little deeper to find out what's that cause what's that root cause so i belong yeah. to a few uh, men's international groups and yeah, what yeah. the group is really about is teaching men to be better men and we're not saying there's yeah. men that are not good men but what we do is we teach men that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to cry. It's okay to show emotions. Like you said, vulnerable, right? Imagine if we can roll this out and teach our local, and, and I speak mainly about South Africa because a lot of the South yeah. Africans shy away from this and they still think they just yeah. macho type kind of thing. It's, it's nothing to do with that. What people need to realize, and even with females, right? We all have double kind of personalities. So we have a feminine yeah. side and a masculine side. Both right. uh, men and women. We just need to be in yeah. touch. We're not saying to the men that you always have to be on your feminine side. If you strike a balance, then your life becomes so much more easier to live. So yeah. I like the fact that you said that, yes, we all need to work on ourselves. And we yeah. need to support the fact that we need to get people to understand that, yes, you must work on yourself. They must be willing to do it, right? Else it's going to be a repetition. Absolutely. But there's so much, it, you know, if you have to think about it, for me, it was easy because I am naturally a rebel. So I didn't care, right? For me now, being authentically and living the truth of who I am was the most important thing. But for a lot of other people, I understand and I have great compassion that there is cultural indoctrination, there is religious indoctrination. Now, if you think about conventional religious ideals, you know, they, there's a prescribed way for a man to be. A, a man is the head of the home. A man has to not adopt any of the feminine qualities. Nurturing is seen as inherently feminine, which is wrong. Um, and that is why it's so difficult for men to connect. As you say, for me, it's the divine feminine and divine masculine. It's that yin and yang, right? And we all have it. In the same token, women uh, you know, have become hard. Women have, be, have lost their, their innate femininity because now there's a point to prove. Um, and you know they, uh, it's so difficult because it feels like we have to wage this war now against men. But for me, it is not a man versus a woman thing. It is a human issue. And I think that is why I refer to myself as an equalist because I feel like, you know, yes, um, for a long time, women have had no kind of um, uh, permission to, to do anything basically. But at the same time, the prescribed way for a man to be just doesn't serve anybody. Um, if you look at a lot of men that have been affected financially through COVID, the rates of suicide in men have increased um, you know, exponentially. And it is the suicide rates in men are four times higher than that of women because they don't threaten, they execute, yeah. right? That is extremely, extremely scary because we put so much of pressure on our men to be the head of the home, to be responsible for the financial well-being of the family, to be the sole protector, um, whereas it needs to be a proper partnership. And that is, that is I think, uh, you know, a conversation that's hard to have, especially with religious indoctrination that comes into play. That's such a valid point, eh? Uh, and and that's, you just hit the nail on the head there as well. I mean, any relationship is about this partnership. It's not just about, yeah. like you said, the man, if, if he's taking all the stress and the pressure, of course, he's going to crumble and fall at, at some point yeah. as well. So we've got yeah. we to put the balance where we start working together and realize it's not, it's not you or me, it's us. That's yeah. why people actually come together to, to work together on that and working on themselves uh, as well. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is this justice system of ours. Uh, okay, no, let's go back one. I, I'm, I'm glad that from what I've heard so far is, although at certain points, we all played victim in our selves, right? We all went into society and victim mindset, etc. Now, you know the conditions that you grew up in, etc. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure, I, and I'm assuming it would, would have been tough as well, right? Um, mm. I come from the same home. Too. I know about poverty. I know about not having food, not having clothes and all of these things. I know exactly what, what it's about, right? As a woman, how, how difficult it was for you growing up in this mindset of not having everything because 
you know there's not enough all the time. You have the scarcity mindset. And now mm. you have your adult years and you this person was loving yourself unconditionally and you're realizing that the more, there's so much more out there for you to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it was almost an accepted thing growing up and I'm sure you'll understand it that everybody struggled and struggled was just like the um, you know, nature of, yeah, you know, it was all around us and that was an accepted norm. I was one of the fortunate few in that, you know, we, we had a, a fairly good uh, childhood in terms of being able to have our own home, um, you know, have food on the table every day. So we were lucky in that sense. There were lots of other issues, you know, um, normal issues in, in the home that um, made me feel as if I just did not fit in. And so the thing that was the most, the hardest for me was trying to break down that mindset because you must know that coming from our communities, um, we like sharing our sad stories. Mm. We like having those pity parties and, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, we understand and accept that everyone is going through something. Nobody actually has conversations about joy. That was something that was extremely hard. Like we just have conversations about, you know, what, what you're struggling with, you know, how bad your marriage is, how rotten your husband is, you know, how uh, hard it is financially or whatever the case may be. Um, and to break down that mindset and to look further than that, it was literally when I left the confines of Peter Maritzburg and moved to Johannesburg that I could see a different way of life. Even though I hadn't started on any kind of spiritual journey because that only happened seven years ago, but I could see the potential. And for me, I think that it was really lacking. Um, the people that were successful by society's definition of success in, in KZN, um, were people that, you know, we couldn't really connect with or uh, resonate with. Um, and they weren't, you know, that kind of lifestyle was not available. But it wasn't even just about that. It was about living a joyous life, having a passionate life, being fully alive. You know, those were concepts that I had learned only in the last seven years that I didn't know was available for me. For me, I thought, you know, struggle is a proviso that came, you know, that was the the manifesto that you sign as a human when you enter this world. And uh, it was, uh, as I say, a whole lot of unbecoming and learning how to be different and learning how to fit into this world in a way that made sense for me. Yeah. No, you, you, you're right. And you know, even up till this day, we have a lot of people that are struggling as well, right? Poverty is really big in, in our country. And I always say to people that, you know, your life doesn't have to end where you are, but the more yeah. you go the self-pity, is complaining, mm -hmm. etc. The more you're gonna stay there, right? So you know, I'm I'm sure you know of a lot of people that complain about health, for example. And the yeah. more they complain about health, the more they're gonna be sick. They're never gonna get better until they shift this mindset and start thinking in in a different way as well. So the one the, the one point I wanted to bring up about the uh, the justice system is with gender based violence, right? We don't have the best of justice systems. We know that, right? You know, and mm -hmm. it's just sad that. You and I, as normal citizens, we would love to do something about it. But what do we do about situations like this? Because women eventually do not report cases, right? Because they know when they go to their police station, they are more harassed than anything else. And that's Absolutely. a sad thing for me. Uh, I mean, if you, if you had to come up with a system or maybe just three or four li lines, just, if you had to come up with something that can better the situation, for anyone reporting a gender-based violence, what would, what would it be? So I think that, you know, for me, the, the frustration is the administrative work that's involved with simply reporting something. The administrative thing of, you know, as, as somebody that's just been violated and having to be in a, pol in a police station and to have complete lack of empathy around you this is the reason, I mean, we've got the highest statistics of gender-based violence and rape, right? Mm -hmm. One of the highest, I think we're the eighth highest in the world. Mm -hmm. And to think about it, um, a huge percentage of cases are not reported. So imagine if we had actual real-time statistics, it would be shocking. I mean, the rates are one in four, one in four. Think about the women in your, in your you know, uh, environment or in your life, one in four, right? 
in their lifetime will experience domestic violence. The first thing is having um, police, police that is, uh, has a basic level of understanding, empathy, and compassion. Because the interrogation that happens there, I mean, I've gone myself to have um, protection order. I literally walked out because I had spent, I think, six hours waiting in a queue um, at the court, right? That was the first thing. I had gone again a couple of years later thinking that we would have made some difference with a friend that was being harassed. And it was the same thing. And then when you get there, you are literally shamed if you don't have the proper evidence. You are literally um, made to feel as if you're lying. And I understand that a lot of women do it for bad reasons. I know a lot of women that have you know, taken that road um, to try and get maintenance money, et cetera, et cetera. But that percentage of those kind of women that lie about it or whatever are very small. I'm talking about the 80% of women that have legitimate concerns. You know, the first thing for me was is to create a system that actually works. That is the most frustrating thing. And that is the one thing where people, is the reason that women would rather, you know, not uh, report it. And then secondly, to, to actually have a protection order enforced. I, I know many people that have gone and gotten a protection order and then were killed afterwards because the response time, if you have to call, you know, the response time for the police to actually get to you is a problem. So for me, there is so many levels of what can be done right now. Um, my dream is to one day have a foundation that houses women, um, temporarily because I know that a lot of women that come to me asking for help can't leave because financially they're not in a position to do so can't report it because if the you know once a protection order gets served they will be killed or they will be beaten even more so to be able to find a, a sort of safe house which is something that's not easily accessible because a lot of the time women have got children um, and then also to sort of conscientize family you know to believe people when they talk to not make excuses for the man. So there's a lot of things that we can do systemically that emanates not just from the justice system, but it's just a, a human consciousness that needs to change. Yeah, and the reason why I mentioned the justice system is because they're failing us, right? So we as normal citizens, oh, totally. we, we got to take take it into our own hands and do something. So I can resonate yeah. with the shelter you were, I was also trying to yeah. do in, in our home yeah. as well. Uh, but yeah. there was just so much of red tape around the security and the husbands coming there and fighting and stuff. And yeah. eventually I just lost interest because I'm in Johannesburg, 500 kilometers away. How am I going to sort anything out? So it really becomes uh, a problem. I like the one thing that you mentioned is we need to teach our police to be more empathetic. They oh, got to understand it. Even if there's, I mean, if there's, yeah. any, if there's any law enforcement people that are watching this video or listening to the audio as well, please, we need to create this department where we have this department solely for gender-based violence. And I'm not saying just have it there for show and put it as a tick mark that, okay, you've done your job. Be real about it. Create it as a real department that can help women out there as well. And then- and the, on, the saddest thing for me, um, knows is the fact that a lot of the time it's the female police women that uh, have complete lack of empathy. I don't know whether it's this, power struggle or wanting to exert power, but it's such unnecessary behavior. I've had that experience where the women, you know, the police women are, you know, completely, um, I don't know if we've become so desensitized as a humanity because these stories have become so much more prevalent where the people have just lost their basic compassion and empathy for one another. But I don't know whether it's, you know, that uh, the police, I don't really have a passion for, um, make, making people's lives better or safer, and I'm just there to get an income at the end of the day. Um, you know, this is a whole different conversation, but, you know, for me, it's like the saddest part is that, you know, it's oftentimes the women as well that uh, don't have that empathy. You would expect the women to understand, you know, and then the, the questioning. I mean, for me, you need to, the administrative task is a such an arduous thing. Yeah. You literally through that process of being beaten and harassed all over again 
it is the worst thing ever to to actually kind of you know to to do and that is why i know a lot of women just seek the private medical help and then they just do their own healing if they heal at all um but yeah to work with our justice system is a shit show yeah no absolutely uh, fully agree and i think we must go back to again the cause and the way we go back to the cause is working in our schools and yeah. start working with yeah. the boys and the girls and the reason why I say yeah. boys and girls is for girls to real, also understand that their bodies are their bodies. They need to also look after their bodies and treat it like a temple, same like with the boy child as well. And I'm not saying that that women, that, that the girls in school are using short dresses or anything, nothing like that. Because even if a girl uses a short dress, boys have got nothing to do with you. She, yeah. It's her way of dressing, Just leave her alone. But we need to educate yeah. the boys in a way because... A lot of the boys are taught about this masculine thing from a very small yeah. young age. They are taught yeah. it's not okay to cry and stuff. I mean, if your mm. own parents can say you're a sissy for crying, what's mm. it for somebody in the community to actually say, say the same thing? Right? Yeah. It's very easy. Yeah. So it goes back to working with the boy child in school, but also with the parents. So parents understand this as well. You now I mentioned earlier on that this youth that we have now. They have so much of potential. I, I normally go, when I go to schools and speak, you can hear the potential. I had the one mm -hmm. where this one black child said to me that his parents told him not to talk to the white child. And I asked wow. him why. He says, no, because of apartheid, etc. So I said, so I didn't go back to his parents. I said to him, so how do you feel about this? He says, no, mm -hmm. I'm not going to listen to my parents. That boy yeah. had to with the apartheid system or whatever happened in the past. So parents have this habit, like they put this into the mind of the child to go get become a doctor. They also put a lot yeah. of in the sense that they put a lot of racial things into the mindsets as well. Yeah. And parents need to start changing their behavior. And no, absolutely. And for me, for me, that actually comes first. So it's you know for when you take uh, and have these conversations at schools, children are still going to go back and see. Well, how their parents are behaving and children will still model that you know i'm very much a firm believer that you can plant a seed but for me it's just going back and having those conversations with the parents because when the parents have to change their behavior it has a ripple effect yeah. it changes consciousness i'm going to tell you quickly i did a survey last year um before i did a webinar on men's mental health i did a survey of i think it was about 75 men um, ranging from, I think the youngest person that participated was 20, and then the oldest was, I think, 65. The results of that survey shocked me to my core, because the people in the early 20s, I think it was a percentage of about 75% of men said that they expect the sex from their partner. So even if the partner says no, they feel that they have a right to it if they're in a relationship or even if they're casually dating someone. Um, another staggering percentage, um, I think it was, uh, you know, 50 or 55%, if I can remember clearly, said that they shoved or pushed or slapped or hit their girlfriend, right? Um, and the percentage for depression, I, depression was 100%. Wow. 100% that they had in the, in at some stage in their life experienced depression and also the percentage to talk to another man, um, you know, a lot of them said, absolutely not. They would rather die than speak to another man because there's so much of this bro code that's going on. And that is something that I absolutely challenge and I get crucified for it because I feel like, you know, that kind of narrative, that kind of terminology needs to change. Yeah. You know, we need to start educating and conscientizing our men to challenge another man when they hear them you know, talk about scoring, when you talk about scoring with the woman, hammering, pounding, you know, all of those words that are used to, um, you know, be the expression of sex. Uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, men, um, you know, getting lucky or, you know, calling girls bitches or whatever the case may be, that, you know, is the thing that propagates all of that violence ideation, that, you know, disrespect. And when you have to start respecting yourself enough, um, and, you know, stepping up and being the change, then you can affect change, you know, in, within your community. But it starts with you. And if you're not willing to do that, um, you know, then we, we're just never going to make progress anywhere. 
No, true. And, and exactly what you said, right? It also starts at the school level when these boys have these competitions, like how many girlfriends mm. they can have, how many mm. girlfriends they can and stuff, right? So they yeah. start yeah. in their mind from a very early age. And as they yeah. get older and older, they feel, okay, now I need to hit a target of 100, then 200. Yeah. I mean, they and at this stage, they're not really worried about protection or AIDS or anything. Mm. Also, mm. they're worried about the person's feelings as yeah. well. So that's the problem. Yeah. That's why we got to go back to school uh, and yeah. that, uh, that start educating them from as early as 12, 13 years old, I would think. That's like one of that's the most. And that's the way we can change this country as well, because the moment we start getting the boys to think better and think for themselves, not somebody mm -hmm. else putting all this nonsense in their minds, we're going to have a reduction in gender-based mm -hmm. violence. We're going to have a reduction in corruption, in feeling, mm -hmm. in so many things. Because now you have a, a people in the right state of mind that are working towards something positive rather than yeah. only negatives in life as well. So we have a lot Absolutely. of work. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. But it starts with us. It, it does start with us as well. I know I try to, I, and I know you've been trying to do this as well. I try to preach this to so many people as well. But with, with us trying to get our message out there, we need people to come in and work together with us so that we can reach, have a bigger reach and get our message yeah. across as well. A lot of the youth realizes, uh, if you look at entrepreneurs, they're chasing this thing where they want to have the status, self-employed, CEO, whatever, but it's more of a status and they would go do something simple, a simple job like selling cell phones, for example, but they're not really following their passion or their purpose. Yeah. So this is where we educate them on how to find their purpose so that they can sustain themselves for a longer time, right? So we have Absolutely. to go back into schools and start teaching them as well. So, yeah. Sivania, uh, you know, I wish we had much, much more time as well. So I want to thank you for inspiring us today. I know the audience is definitely going to be inspired on inspirational journeys uh, with Straight Talk with Nolan. But before we let you go as well, uh, I'd like to know about the projects that you're working on. How can people help you? I mean, the only way we're going to grow in the 21st century is by collaborating with each other and working together. People that have the mentality of working in a silo environment, it is so old school. We don't need that anymore. Uh, not now. So how can you mm -hmm. about some of the projects? Because I know you're working on some fantastic projects as well. Yeah. So I think the, the frustration comes with the fact that um, I have been trying for the last maybe two years to get corporate buy-in to actually start doing more proactively within the workplace. Um, so to have conversations around mental health continuously and to have domestic violence awareness training and support in the workplace. Um, unfortunately, what happens with our uh, corporates is that it becomes a tick box exercise for once or twice in the year, usually for 16 days of activism or for mental health awareness month, then it's just a tick box exercise. Now I come from advertising. I'm an editor by profession. So I know exactly the spend that's available that businesses have to use towards wellness or CSI. But you know, it becomes a thing of having this continuous argument and fight about um, you know, trying to convince people of the importance between mental health and productivity. So I've got um, you know, a few things uh, that I've been trying to do is either to come on board with corporates to really talk about mental health in the workplace, because obviously that's the foundation. When you get that right, then you will see the, the rates of GBB um, dismiss being you know, lessened, uh, but also to support people within the workforce. Um, I've actually just written a guide, which I think is massively important of how um, employers can assist employees that are victims of domestic violence. Because I know many, many, many stories of people that you know, have been killed in the workplace that are continuously harassed by their partners in the workplace and they have to be quiet about it. I was one of them that was, you know, used to try and keep silent um, while my, my partner used to come and fetch me from work and, you know, it would turn out to be quite violent, et cetera. And um, so I know exactly coming from that space of having the experience of it, what employers need to be doing. Now, trying to get people to actually, you know, um, have those conversations, you know, bring me in 
to you know, uh, conscientize leaders about what you can do in that space has been an upward journey. So you know, that is the one thing that I really want is I've been doing a lot of uh, self-funded projects, which I can't do anymore. Um, you know, literally saving people, taking people out of their homes, finding alternative places for them to be. Um, you know, and we need sponsorships for that kind of thing. We need people to be able to donate to this kind of thing. I'm trying to put together a safety fund for women that cannot leave because of, you know, being financially dependent. But obviously to find even a one bedroom place requires rent and, um, you know, groceries and basic things. Um, so these are the things that, you know, I've been trying to do by myself for the longest time, but you can't do it in isolation. You definitely need help and support. So through my organization, Feminine Rising, um, through my agents, where I can be booked to come in and do a talk, um, there are lots of ways. I mean, people can, if they just want to get the strength to be able to start owning their truth, um, you know, to subscribe to my content channel on Patreon, there's a lot of things, ways to get in touch to be able to lend your support or actually, you know, start doing the work yourself. Yeah. That's great. That And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping uh, and I'm sure the corporates that do listen to audios like this would like to jump on. And I agree fully with you. It mustn't only be done on that special day, 16 days of activism. It should be a continuous thing because you do it once, you mark it as a tick box. What happens to the balance of 364 days? The same exactly. is happening all the time. And Absolutely. In, in fact, all of these special days uh, that we celebrate as well, I think it's a whole lot of hogwash because why do we only celebrate it? Just on the day, we put it on yeah. social media, make everyone look glamorous and everything, done and dust. Yeah. And yet yeah. we go back yeah. to the same situation uh, yeah. again as well. So, Tanya, yeah. once again, thank you so much for uh, sharing and inspiring the audience today as well. Thank you to everyone that's listening. Please uh, be sure to connect our channel. Our YouTube channel is Straight Talk with Nolan. You can follow us on social media. The handle is Straight Talk with Nolan as well. And just stay connected and enjoy your journey through life. And if you are reaching out or needing any assistance, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, Tavania has given, given us an inspirational journey of what she's been through. So don't ever think you're alone. You're not alone as well. So this is your host, Nolan Play, and I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you.